Welcome everybody to the April session of the webinar series, Global Initiatives in Science and Practice of Ecosystem Restoration. We are joined here today by Willem Thwerda, Chief Enabling Officer of Common Land, and he'll be presenting today on four returns, experiences with a holistic model to scale up the restoration of degraded landscapes through inspiring communities, developing new business models, and blended finance. Willem is a former head of the Tropical Rainforest Small Grants Program in the Netherlands Office of the IUCN. He also served as a director of that office. He initiated Leaders for Nature, which is an international network of CEOs in the business community who act as advocates for sustainable and responsible dealing with biodiversity. After joining the Rotterdam School of Management, Willem published Four Returns, Three Zones, 20 Years, a holistic framework for ecosystem restoration by people and businesses for the next generations. In 2013, Florida founded Common Land together with Rotterdam University, IUCN CEM, and supported by funders. Since then, he is the Chief Enabling Officer for Common Land, an organization that is active worldwide in promoting sustainable development through the rest restoration of large degraded areas. So thank you very much for being with us today, Willem, and I'm gonna pass this off to you. Thank you. So I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, you know, the ecosystem degradation challenge we are facing uh, over the last decades. And this will increase uh, every time, every year, more and more. And, and it's, of course, fascinating that we now live in a time where uh, people indeed are, uh, are sacrificing uh, social to social sacrificing for global commons in related to the, uh, the to the coronavirus and this might also you know have a positive impact on on serving the global goods of uh, of ecosystem restoration and you all know the causes because you're all experts uh, agriculture forestry mining infrastructure etc uh, and you also know that that uh, ecosystem restoration benefits are on the uh, topics of climate mitigation, food security and biodiversity. And in that light, it's, it's great to see that uh, the UN decade on ecosystem restoration was coming alive last year, thanks to El Salvador, and it will start in 2021. So there are many great things popping up that will help us to, uh, to create the opportunities for uh, restoration activities and boost the scaling up of ecosystem restorations and we also know that this you know there's a, a huge cost uh, uh, effect here uh, if we can work on from that perspective um, you know the, the TEEP studies and also other studies the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment have shown that uh, that we are talking about a trillion dollar industry if we do it well so Following the World Resources Institute and other studies, people and scientists, the scientists think that we are talking more or less about the two billion hectares area. If we talk about land masses, that is the size of the United States and China combined. So the, the opportunity is tremendous. However, and, and we know where it is, more or less. However, the issue is that technically, we know quite well how to restore large degraded areas, like here in the Lus Plateau in China. And you can argue, of course, scientifically about what restoration exactly is and, and whether they did it well or not. But the fact is that they are in China and the Lus Plateau continuously working on restoring a lot of ecological functionalities in that landscape with different type and mixture of species. Most of the species, by the way, used here are Robinia species that were not native for the, uh, for the area. So we are gaining momentum. This movement of ecological restoration, of ecosystem restoration is gaining momentum and it's time to act uh, uh, due to you know, all the uh, international agreements and, and reports that, are, that have been uh, have been uh, published over the last uh, years. But there's also a new phenomena going on in the world at this moment. And yeah, you need, you know, especially now, I couldn't ignore this fact that uh, that po uh, post-COVID time, COVID-19 time, 
um, is popping up at a certain moment. And we could wonder whether the current political system is uh, designed for these kind of uh, pandememias or is designed well enough to take up this huge challenge. So what I did is uh, after I left IUCN in 2012, I looked into um, as uh, looked into you know how can how how can we create something that is supportive to scale up large landscape restoration initiatives, and um, when talking to um, to investors, for instance, I quite often realized that actually those people are waiting for pipeline project pipeline and they they couldn't find or they cannot find landscape restoration project pipeline that is big enough and that is uh, is not uh, having too many risks so quite often when I spoke to those people I, re I, I got these kind of answers you know this is really an innovative approach but I'm afraid we can't consider it as it has never been done before that was the standard answer um, so the quest was for myself and also to, to look into how can we translate the ecosystem approach in something that is very practical and understood by investors, by farmers, and still is, is, is strong enough and, 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 and well scientific embedded enough that experts can, can say, yes, this, this will be workable. Um, the quest was how to capture this system change at the landscape level. Um, and I thought, yeah, actually what is needed is a kind of a language tool, a language framework that, that everyone would understand. So that, that could be helpful in a multiple, multiple stakeholder, set, stakeholder setting. Uh, and that would include, include business cases, uh, and it should be practical, inclusive, and of course, holistic. And another thing, is um, building up on my experiences uh, working with governments and overseas development aid uh, and DFIs and developing finance institutions. Um, I've realized that project sizes and project duration or time frames of five or four years wasn't good enough. Was it wasn't you know it wasn't practical and actually it was unrealistic. So long term is important here but how long is long term you know from an ecological perspective as an ecologist uh, you would probably say 50 years 100 years but from a business perspective you know five years or a quarter is maybe more realistic and from an investor perspective you know minimum you know yeah you know, let's say maximum 15 or 10 years is is quite long already and for farmers it's very different at all so First of all, talking about a language, I thought it's important that we understand and create a kind of a common sense what is going on from, a, from an investment perspective as well. And I realized that talking to investors and farmers, they all were talking in the words, uh, and they were all talking, you know, using two words, risks and returns. So I tried to squeeze in one sentence that was basically useful to show what was going on uh, so ecological restoration degradation basically is coming from maximizing fine return on investment per hectare that's what happening all over the world and that is creating biodiversity loss so by adding the those two words per hectare i could show to investors that the impact of a lot of investments had a very negative impact on biodiversity because without those two words per hectare, maximizing return on investment basically is what is what has been taught at business schools for, for, for decades. That is the mantra, that's what you learn there. Working from the word returns, I use the word returns also for farmers and visiting farmers and going to the field and doing interviews everywhere and that's what i've been doing let's say over the last uh, yeah, 15 years i realized that in degraded areas people actually uh, people but also that the area if you really summarize it you can you can say that land degradation leads to four losses a loss of purpose or hope a loss of employment and security 
a loss of biodiversity, of course, and soil, water, vegetation cover, and a loss of economic activity. You know, those four losses gave me the opportunity to create that language of four returns. Because if you have a landscape with four losses, you want to transform that landscape into a place where you can have four returns. And that was the first step. And the return of inspiration was the number one return that you need to bring back if you want to create change at the landscape level. From inspiration, you can talk about jobs. And from jobs, it will be easier to go towards the natural capital situation, biodiversity. And then you can think about what kind of businesses are needed that are sustainable and also generate income, financial capital. So that was the first step. So for returns was born at that time. The next step was if you want to land those four returns at a landscape scale, we need to think in zoning. And here uh, ecosystem thinking comes back because eco ecologists always think in zone, are, are thinking in zones or buffer zones or, or ecosystem zoning, whatever you call it. But here it is, it's different. A, a landscape zoning approach basically is created to give people the understanding uh, of, of, where, of, a, of where they are, a, a sense of place, you could say. It gives them also an understanding or a, a, of, of, uh, the, of an overview of, of, of an area. So what I did is I created three zones. A natural zone where, where people restore the ecological foundation and by the, or, or conserve it. it, could be a protected area, for instance. Um, an economic zone, basically urban areas, infrastructure, uh, places where, you, uh, where, where people deliver high and sustainable economic productivity, quite often also monocultures still, and an in-between zone, a combined zone. And that is the place where you, where you deliver, uh, by a, where you return or restore biodiversity, as well as return sustainable productivity. So here, it delivers productivity and biodiversity. And within those, within the setting of three zones, people got a better understanding of how, what was working. The other component I added was time. But coming back to the three zones, I realized in, in, that in many projects, people already use zones or zoning. And this is an example in Tamil Nadu in, in India, where, uh, where, where a farmer's community created a whole zoning approach. And it was just beautiful to see that basically what they did, they used a three zone approach. They had a natural place, wetlands areas, they had a sustainable land use place and a place where they were working. And talking about the time component, um, um, yeah, if you don't use a realistic time frame most of the projects will fail or you are running from one fundraising activity to another fundraising activity and you don't have sufficient time to do the work with, with the local community uh, uh, well enough. So for me, it was important to choose one generation, 20 years. A minimum period of 20 years is needed because less is just not realistic. This is an example of a farmer who planted in Spain, who planted a tree 30 years ago on the right side, a home tree, home oak tree, while on his land he had two old growth trees still living there of more than 800 years old, because this area was a forest once. And he said to me, I need 50 years or probably 100 years to really restore this area. But it's very tough to convince other farmers. So four returns are delivered by a three-zone approach during a minimum period of 20 years. And in 2015, I published this. You can find it on the web at IUCN CEM um, with all the things behind it and the KPIs and whatever is uh, needed to, uh, to uh, whatever, you know, whatever is needed to, to build the theory right. Um, but then, of course, it was time to look into the policy um, and also to time to, to do it, basically. And if you look towards, you know, the, the international policy, you, you immediately tap into the sustainable development goals. And we all know that, you know, uh, restoration or ecosystem restoration is directly addressing a lot of these uh, sustainability goals. 
um, I think it is basically directing the no hunger goal, the clean water goal, the gender equality, the good jobs and economic growth goal, climate action, responsible consumption, life below water, life on land, and ultimately, of course, partnerships. So indirectly, it even reaches almost all the goals. What I've realized is that the sustainability goal number 17 probably is the most important one. Uh, the other ones are all thematic, but if we cannot create long-term landscape restoration partnerships, that is using goal number 17, nothing will happen. So in 2013, we founded Common Land and we've learned step by step to use five process steps to work at a landscape level with a four returns holistic landscape uh, restoration approach. First, you need to uh, find out a place. Quite often uh, a local NGO or farmers association can, uh, uh, you know, can approach you and, and ask you for help to start. So you need to look where to start, where are the conditions good enough to start? Are there local landscape leaders? Um, how is the ecological condition? Are there uh, crops that can be uh, turned into regenerative agriculture? Um, what is the, the local government doing uh, uh, or the national government? How are the policies and so on? So that is what we call the discover phase. Then if you have started in an area um, and people have invited you, you are stepping into the domain of creating a landscape vision for the long run. So what is the vision of the people who are living in this place to restore this area and uh, let's say in, in 20 or 30 years and how should that landscape look like and are they dreaming about it or not? And you create them lands a landscape partnership and that could be anything in between a farmers association to a local conservation NGO that is uh, working with a local government. So let's say people from different um, backgrounds who are living there entering into a partnership. The next phase is that you're going to design through mapping the three landscape zones and get an overview of what's happening there and what you can do in the different zones. And of course, the step after that is, uh, is identifying all kinds of business cases uh, that could be regenerative or helping to restore that area. And then the next phase is looking into finance. Where does the money come from? Do we need grants? Do we need public money? Uh, do we need loans? Um, so this is what people quite often call blended finance. So let's look a bit further. How does these four returns work in practice? Yeah, that's what we started to do in 2013 when we uh, we started uh, with Commonland. Uh, Commonland was founded by uh, by the Irish and CEM, by the Rotterdam School of Management, a business school in the in the Netherlands, and and um, we were able to find some some philanthropists also to help us to to set this up. So that was um, that was uh, very important to to build a proof of concept, and we looked into four different areas: um, Mediterranean or subtropical areas uh, in Spain, um, a more subtropical area with a very different system, a water catchment system in South Africa, uh, Western Australia, which has been uh, very much degraded and deforested over the last 150 years. And from 2016, even the Dutch government asked us to, uh, to, uh, to look into um, a system in the, in the Netherlands. And we ended up in the peat meadow system which is a very degraded you could see you could say a green desert system a wetland system and heavily populated as well so we started to work in those areas with landscape partnerships and um, and build a kind of a proof of concept learning by doing doing by learning in each of these landscapes we follow this these five process steps so discover scout and select uh, co-create a vision and landscape partnerships, design and co-create mapping, uh, and then bring business development up and running. 
and and meanwhile look for, looking for different sources of finance and also identify a model for finance for monetization of a landscape um, for all those steps uh, we have we gradually learned um, how what kind of criteria were needed um, what kind of people we were needing we were needing what kind of language uh, we needed so it was a lot of um, you know a lot of um, So over time, in those four areas, um, we were able to uh, to create those landscape partnerships. Sometimes this partnership already existed, like in South Africa, a local NGO called Living Lands, working in the uh, Port Elizabeth water catchment, uh, five, uh, half a million thousand, half, a, half a million hectares area. Uh, they already have been working there for uh, probably fifteen years. Um, in Spain, in Altiplano, in southern Spain, in Andalusia, between the city of Granada and Murcia, um, there was actually, there were some NGOs, but there was not a kind of a landscape partnership with farmers, local conservation organizations, and, and the local governments. It, it, it didn't exist, so we created it ourselves, over law, it's called now. In Australia, in Western Australia, there were some activities uh, with farmers, uh, and also from the university and 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 uh, from uh, you know organizations who were working on restoration and tree planting and and natural resource management, but quite often they weren't united in a global in a in a local vision. So and and what we did there is we first started to uh, to set up a company, wide open agriculture. So we took a different path there, um, and now we are working together to sort out to create local landscape partnership as well. And in the Netherlands, um, we created a local landscape partnership for the peat meadows. Although there are a lot of NGOs and a lot of good initiatives already going on, the, 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 let's say the ecosystem approach was not properly used. And that's how we, uh, for the peat meadow system. And, and that's how we uh, were able to, uh, to set this up. In each of those areas, we, um, during, uh, over the last few years, we were able to set up some companies as well. In Spain, we set up an almond company, a regenerative uh, production company. In South Africa, we set up two companies, and one of them was were actually working on regenerative uh, and still is uh, uh, aromatic oils, while uh, we were able to get a lot of goat keepers, uh, uh, turning goat keepers into aromatic oil produ producers. And in, uh, and in Australia, regenerative agriculture and regenerative um, rotational meat has not, is now going to, um, to clients uh, with a new brand called uh, Dirty Clean Food. And even wide open agriculture uh, was brought to the uh, Australian Stock Exchange in, in 2018. And in, in the Netherlands, we are now working on, on three companies. One of them is, uh, is regenerative milk. Uh, and another one is regenerative uh, tea, herb tea production. So gradually we are learning and learning to create uh, a different, yeah, different ways of working. And let me, let, let me take you a little bit further in how that works. So first of all, if you have, this, if you have selected or if you are working in a, at a landscape setting, um, the, creating a landscape partnership is critical. Uh, quite often people are already working to react together to create such a partnership. Um, and sometimes it helps if you have a kind of a methodology uh, that, that, that really digs deep into the different layers of, of, of individual people and organizational uh, uh, stuff or institutions. We use the theory U model at the MIT, and it's a co-creation process. We we work through different steps with people, create a, uh, to co-create a new plan and a new dream for a whole area, and you do that together in sessions. So it takes time. You bring people together, you you bring them together in uh, you know with meals, uh, quite often for a few days. Um, and yeah, the best thing is, of course, if you can compensate farmers so that they can join and team up uh, and, and really um, work together towards, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a, a, a new way of looking, 
um, how a landscape could look like in let's say a decade or two decades. So this is a this is one of the key elements of our four terms three zones twenty years approach. Uh, together with the mapping and together with the profound understanding of the landscape and and together with you know making use of of the profound wisdom of of local farmers local land users and landowners and ecologists and so on with this tool uh, we are we were able to to transform mindsets of farmers and people in those landscapes so give me let me dig a little bit deeper into the case of spain in in spain we we started in 2014 as you can see in this picture and uh, in 2014 we asked uh, this group of farmers i think at that moment there were 30 farmers who joined us at the first session and we asked them to dream about how this landscape a very degraded deforested uh, de de dehydrated landscape um, how this landscape look, would look like within their dreams using these four turns three zone approach within 20 years so in 2034 and what they said after the first session of three days they said this landscape should be green and regenerative it should use agroecologies as the way of living it should be the, the green lung of this place we're talking about a million hectares and um, we should more have we should have a more uh, um, social and uh, system in place where young people would not leave anymore and go to the city migrate to the cities but where the schools will be open again uh, where where we have a vivid and a lively uh, community where the, um, the the abandonment of villages is uh, is no longer taking place so a lot of these things were uh, were opening up and a lot of uh, good suggestions came out these meetings as well and actually what happened is that this was the beginning of a kind of a you could say a master plan of that huge region of a million hectares uh, the kickstart of it so we started with this process and within six months those farmers started their own foreign farmers land use association called Alvelo. so here if you dig a little bit deeper into the case of Spain, I'll show you some slides. First of all, here you see the, the situation where it is situated. So you, you can see it is, it is pretty big. Uh, the pictures show also a landscape that is heavily degraded over, over centuries, um, where people still live from, uh, from almonds, rain-fed almonds, but the rainfall is really going down and uh, people are leaving. Um, the soil type is harsh, um, it's tough, to uh, to um, to survive in those areas because it's uh, the growing season the growth season is is scarce it's only between um, let's say uh, spring and uh, an autumn it's only in spring and autumn while in summer it's too hot and in winter it's too cold um, most of the forest has gone there is some savanna step system left but that's uh, everything is overgrazed and uh, shade is a scarce uh, thing and vegetation cover is, is, is also very scarce. While this area was a place, uh, you know, a few hundred years ago where you still had dense forest and you had vivid savanna system, sap system. Um, but uh, yeah, that all has, has disappeared. Um, and if it rains, uh, a lot of soil is just washed away. So you can imagine that uh, it's not an easy place to start. A, a place with a lot of challenges, um, but also with a lot of good things. I mean, the people are, uh, uh, it's a poor place, so people are open for new things and people are open to, to, to take up uh, the challenges and really make the change possible if, um, if they get some guidance. And that's what we do. So we started with them to develop a kind of an overview of what was all possible uh, by mapping, uh, uh, identifying business cases, looking into where are the potential uh, natural areas where you can uh, connect corridors and all these uh, things. And we map them together with them. And, uh, and it took that, that takes a while uh, because meanwhile, these, this, this, this farmers association was growing and growing as well. I think there are no more than uh, 300 members now. 
And uh, together with them, we mapped that area and we, we looked into the future and we did the mapping, let's say kind of future mapping with them while at, they already started doing things, as you can see in this picture here, by creating swales in the landscape and all kinds of uh, waterworks to, to harvest and capture the water so that every drop would stay into, in the system. So this is what they, what they foresee in five years. The dark green are protected areas. The light green are new natural areas that actually need to be become established by planting trees or, or protection measures, uh, halting, grazing, and so on. This is what they foresee in 10 years. The green areas in the natural zone are going to be are growing and gradually are going to be connected. This is what they foresee in 20 years. So with these mapping exercises, you help them to create a vision on the ground because you need, you know, you need to, to make sure that with the mapping exercises, they get a, this, this overview of, of the zoning. So this, this, is, this is the mapping exercise and, and we have much more material, of course, um, for the natural zone in this Altiplano in Spain. If you look at the type of interventions, you see uh, that we need to substitute pine forests with endemic trees, quite often oak trees, a lot of species. Um, fencing is important. Uh, new plantations, new tree, new tree planting, of course, with endemic species, with a whole range of species, and green infrastructures for water harvesting. All these things are needed, and probably even more. Um, and we also started with iconic projects, because then you can show people what's happening. So we started with tree planting, uh, and, or, and, and under the replanted pine trees, we, we started planting uh, oak, home oak trees. Um, with, with all kinds of funders, but also other initiative starters. Farmers themselves started with new iconic projects. They started with innovative aromatic production projects in, in places where there was nothing left. Uh, because, uh, so this, this case here, that was an inspirational project that, uh, that's now being imp implemented. Uh, the farmer says, we you know, we have a lot of rock paintings in our area, but no one is visiting those rock paintings. We would love to put those rock paintings in, you know, near the highway in, 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 in a design with aromatics. And that brought so much energy that within a few months, the local government, a local aromatic producer, um, a local NGO, that they all work together to make this happen. So these kind of things are just happening by making the time available and the potential available of, of, of what, is, what is there already. Looking into the combined zones, uh, where you quite often are talking about regenerative almond production with green cover and these kinds of things, that is uh, not very, very common yet in that area, but now becoming more and more common. So moving from monoculture almond production towards agroforestry system with different species and ground cover and swales that is the way how we, how we see this. This area has potential of 150,000 hectares of regenerative almonds uh, or regenerative systems um, uh, into, and, and turn that into that combined zone where you produce biodiversity and produce um, productivity uh, that people can, uh, can sell and use. So this is how, how it looks like. But in five years, they had identified several farms. Those farms are already are now active. Um, more farms are coming on board now through trainings and, and courses and, and, and through the network. We have several WhatsApp networks and so on. <clears throat> and within 20 years, actually, they want to cover the whole area, the whole area where the potential of, of monocultures uh, are turned into um, regenerative or polycultures systems. And how does that look like? I'll give you an impression here. So this is where it starts first with swales and planting trees. You create corridors within the landscape itself, itself as well, uh, with almonds and oak trees. And, and this is how it should go. So of course there are already leaders in that landscape, like this farmer who already has been building soil over the last 10 years in a very tough, very tough system where it's very difficult to create vegetation cover in between the, uh, in this case, uh, olive production. 
Uh, but you see that he he has built soil, and the soil that he hands that he got in his hands now is ten centimeter. It took him ten years to build ten centimeters of topsoil. So, yes, it is possible to turn this this landscape into a more regenerative a combined zone landscape where you have ecological or natural corridors uh, mingling around in a kind of a mosaic landscape, but it takes a lot of time and it takes economics. So it's also important to look into what are the economics of this area. And we started in this case with almonds, uh, but we are now looking into di different crops, almonds, rye, wine, olives, pistachio. So a whole mix of crops, bees, honey, tourism, uh, we all brought that together and they the farmers themselves identified let's say the hot spots of economic uh, activities small villages that should be developed more and more as hot spots for the region and uh, they are communicating this now to the local governments they you know they they they're making plans uh, they are looking into uh, subsidies and all kind of things to to make this happen yeah um for us, it's important that we fuel this process, that we help to build this process, that we are able to create uh, companies and we are now working on the second company. Uh, the first company is La Almendra Hesa, the company you've seen here where they work on the regenerative almonds and, multi and work in, in line and very much in tune, of course, with the landscape um, partnership Alvelo, which is a local NGO now. Um, and we including we still use this, these, these four returns as a kind of as that really give guidance and brings them always back to you know what I'm what am I doing here what is the purpose of my action is this action fulfilling the goals of those four returns within a landscape zoning approach do I do I do I as a farmer or do we as a as a company or as a, as a as a local government are we taking the right actions if you look from an ecosystem perspective of course they don't use the word ecosystem perspective but they use the zoning. So far, these almonds are now sold in several European uh, countries, uh, but we are just at the beginning and we are now talking to large, uh, large uh, companies, uh, more multinationals who are wakening up for regenerative agriculture and, and, and looking into these kinds of products. And that's, that is a process where we uh, give guidance and where we help to build the relationship um, yeah, and the, the projections for, for almonds are positive. Uh, of course, this is one of the products that uh, increasingly is uh, doing well in international markets. You see it in California, you see it in Spain, you see it in other places. Um, but of course, diversity here is the key word. Yeah, Australia is a... So that is an example of Spain. Um, if you look into Australia, um, uh, we have uh, walked a different path. Uh, we, all, we started there, as I said before, with a company and not with a, a landscape partnership uh, that basically had, because of a few reasons, one of the reasons was is that the area is, is, is very big and very empty, there are not too many people living there. There are some good um, conservation organizations and uh, uh, we are very much uh, working with them now. Uh, but we, we decided to start with a company to, to use that as a, as a you know, for, for two reasons. First of all, it was probably the best entry point um, because the farmers think in business, they don't think in NGO-ish activities. And the second one, because we uh, were able to bring this company to the Australian Stock Exchange as a small caps, um, that gave a lot of publicity for uh, regenerative agriculture and also for our four returns holistic landscape story. So it was also a kind of a, a mobilization way of, uh, uh, of working. But now uh, we are very much working in, in, uh, with others to create this uh, holistic landscape movement in Western Australia. And since last year also um, uh, the Aboriginal community in Western Australia joined us or joined this movement. And, and uh, basically they have so much experience and they have so much knowledge is that they, they can drive processes uh, with their profound knowledge much faster. Um, than, than, than we can. So it is, uh, it's now um, what, we, what we see is that this, this, this um, uh, movement is going pretty fast. 
Uh, here, again, we make use of the labs, so the Theory U labs, where we bring uh, a lot of people together uh, with our Australian partners and colleagues, and they drive that process of, of creating um, understanding of holistic landscape management and what it, what it means for uh, the Australian, the West Australian society, but also, you know, if we talk about Australia now, after the fires, uh, what it means for a kind of new economy in that whole country. And uh, here again, uh, there are, of course, already beautiful examples um, in Australia. This is uh, Aboriginal land where they started to, uh, to, uh, to restore that land uh, some, some 15 years, some 12 years ago. And uh, similar processes happened with, uh, with yeah, great organizations uh, that have been working, whether with, with, with carbon money, for instance, but also with, with holistic landscape management or, or rotational grazing activities. So this movement um, is unstoppable. Uh, that's what we think now. Yeah, and just before um, finalizing my, my, my talk, uh, a little bit about the Netherlands, uh, because uh, maybe some of you think, you know, why, why should you use something in such a heavily populated uh, artificial country? Um, but I think it's good to also uh, show that this model works everywhere. That's, that's our ambition. We just want to show it, it works. It doesn't matter where you are. It, 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 doesn't, it, it does not depend from, a, from, an, from an ecosystem or doesn't depend on an ecosystem or on, 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 or on, on social conditions. You can use it everywhere. Uh, and in the Netherlands, which is a very uh, heavily populated country, uh, we finally decided to uh, work uh, in the neighborhood of Amsterdam, which is uh, the capital. Uh, the capital is important because uh, you have uh, a lot of innovations there, also on, the, um, on food. So if you create uh, a new food production, regenerative food, uh, you, the market is uh, very close and that helps. Um, Amsterdam and the whole surroundings of Amsterdam are, are situated in a landscape called the peat meadow system. You know, those green meadows, there's a lot of water, uh, but those meadows are heavily degraded. Uh, there's no biodiversity left. Uh, it is intensively used. It is all about maximization of return on investment per hectare. So what can you do here? And then you have, by the way, you have the water management system. Uh, quite often those peat meadows are, are, are drained. That means that they produce a lot of CO2 um, and uh, that from an infrastructural perspective, it's very expensive to build houses there as well. So um, infrastructure is, uh, is costly. Since we started in 2016-17, we were able to set up a, a new landscape uh, <coughs> partnership there. And uh, meanwhile, there are now uh, quite some farmers active and joining this, this movement. Uh, as well as cons local conservation organizations. And this movement is growing fast. Uh, our goal here is, is, is same like in other places, is to using this, this landscape vision and landscape dreaming through the U process and through all kinds of workshops on soil building, on, on different crop systems, on, on different grazing systems, you name it, uh, to go from a mono-use degraded landscape system in towards a multifunctional, mosaic, diverse, resilient peat meadow landscape system with uh, not only cows, uh, not only uh, cows that only produce milk for cheese, the famous cheese you probably know, but also uh, uh, wetland systems, um, uh, health systems, um, <clears throat> tourism activities, different type of cows instead of the milk producing cows we go for a type of cow a more resilient type of race that 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 can survive in wet systems produce meat milk and uh, and and uh, and also will maintain the system has a less impact on that on the, on the grasslands so biodiversity will increase so there are a lot of things that is now sorting out with the farmers and also increasingly with, uh, with local conservation organizations as well as with the local government, because they are gradually more and more interesting in, in working on this system. Also, because um, it can bring down the emissions of carbon. So, yeah, we are currently building a track record. 
in this with this forward turns approach in other countries as well with other other um, other partners uh, and other funders uh, we are still we still are feel, feel that we are in the beginning but we are now gradually having a sufficient confidence that we can roll this out and and bring others on board to learn how it works and and hopefully that others will copy it and use it uh, because that's our ambition uh, we don't want to be owner of a of an approach, uh, this is an open source thing. We just want um, we want to be to make it possible that we, as movement together, can create pipeline for investors and funders all over the world to to roll out this yeah you could say new ecosystem restoration industry. That's our ambition, and therefore we need to speak one language because it. We as experts speak different languages. You know, we never can make the connection with the finance community or with the farmers community or with, um, yeah, with the policymakers. We need to get our act together and create one approach, one language that is easy to understand. And, and of course, we all know that, um, that if you look at the landscape level and you know, I'm an ecologist by training, so I know that the, the, the complexity of ecology and ecosystems is huge. But if we are not able to create a simple system that everyone understands, while we know that underneath there's a lot of complexity, uh, we will never be able to, uh, to create this, uh, this industry. And therefore also we need to think in how, what kind of, what kind of finance do we need? And you know, financiers and, and investors, they come, they look every day, they look into the market and, and try to find opportunities that give a high return and a low risk, because that's our job. But we are coming from the landscape perspective. So we look from what does a landscape need? And if you can see, if you know, our experiences so far is that to create a landscape partnership and to maintain a landscape partnership, so a local team that is building this holistic landscape, integrated landscape management system, we need at least 500, K, so that half a million dollars or euro per year. That means for 20 years period, we need at least 10 million euros. But if, you know, 10 million euros only to, to create that landscape partnership and to make sure that the right things are done and that business development is developed in such a way that it is pro-landscape instead of against it, uh, that is nothing compared to what a landscape of a million hectares can deliver, you know, uh, bringing down risks, risks for local governments, uh, creating new pipeline opportunities for investors, um, make sure that, 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 that uh, philanthropists or foundations can work with all kinds of uh, projects, whether it's carbon or grants subsidized projects to do all kinds of things around biodiversity or watershed management. All these things into this big puzzle uh, um, can be united. But you need to have a kind of a motor, a kind of a, 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 a guidance group that, that, that will give guidance to this process. And that will cost half a million per year. That's by building trust, by doing the stakeholder facilitation and, and doing the right business development. That's how, what we have uh, discovered so far. And we have worked it out uh, in a report with, together with KPMG that will come out one of these uh, weeks. Um, uh, we call that the true returns of large-scale holistic landscape restoration. And some of those slides are coming from that report where, we, where you can see that you can describe the impacts per return. Um, and we see nine key impacts that are converted into either cash flows or risk reduction. Um, uh, and we also, you can also look into what you know what benefits are there for, for, for all those stakeholders. And you can also use the four returns for making sure what kind of benefits are there for farmers or local communities or private investors or, or philanthropists or insuring companies or water intense industries. So you can all specify that in a relatively simple way. Of course, I understand and that you know, this is not as simple as it, as, as it looks like, but the fact is we need to simplify this to make sure that people come on board. And that's what you try to establish. And also to build bridges with, in this case, the financial sector, so that they understand where what funding is required, what kind of financial returns are, are 
coming back within 20 years? And what are the different entities where these returns are, returns are coming from? Sometimes it is coming from bringing down risks. Others are coming from erosion prevention, carbon, you name it. But we need to make that ready for them in such a way that we can have a good conversation because we need those people as well. So I'm almost um, uh, at my last, last slides. Uh, meanwhile, um, yeah, how to, how to continue with this work? Uh, we are working together with others uh, in, in the Thousand Landscapes uh, Initiative. We, our ambition is that we want to create an international platform using these, uh, the, 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 the different steps, uh, the four returns, the zoning and the 20 years methodology. And together with the EGREC partners, Stack Matters, UNDP, Rainforest Alliance, and WWF, we are looking into uh, these, 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 uh, the methodology now. And, and that, that might be the methodology, as I described before, five elements, five process steps, impact, four returns, places, three zones, and a period of uh, minimum a generation. At this moment, we are testing the, uh, a first platform already. You can go to it, it's called foreturns.earth, and you can load up your stories, your landscapes, and your stories, uh, what you would like to share, um, and, and, uh, and, uh, and use the toolbox you have, or use our toolbox, and see if you can be connected to others, uh, because I think it's all about about uh, building this movement now, creating connectivity, creating a language that works, uh, learning from each other by doing, and then seek for the right funders. I think that's what's needed uh, now. Yeah, I think I stop here. We have goals and we have learnings. I've mentioned a lot of those learnings so far. But I think uh, this is my last slide. So I hope you liked it and I think Restoring our soil, as a farmer once said to me, is basically restoring our soul. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Willem. That was really a fantastic and visionary overview of having a thousand landscapes involved in restorative activities. There have been a lot of questions coming in uh, into the chat. I think there's about 20 of them. In addition, Brock has done a great job of adding the links to the different documents that you were talking about. So the uh, IUCN um, report on the four returns is posted there and the soil video is posted there as well as some other things. So for participants who need to leave right at the hour, this will be if you didn't get a chance to have your question asked, before you need to leave, you can view the video through the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group web page on IUCN's page, and I believe that was distributed with your registration information, um, as well as on YouTube. So you can look for the Thematic Group YouTube channel and view it there. So with that, I'll launch right in here. The first question is from Linda Spencer with the United States Forest Service. And she asked, Willem, who were the key partners in South Africa? I worked with the university to develop and deliver a high school curriculum for sustainable agriculture through USAID. It was critical to have a strong in-country partner every step. Your point about sustainability of the project is so important. Two years after our project, there's no one using it. USAID is not set up to grant long-term money. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, very, uh, I like the question of Linda very much. Um, first of all, the, the, the partners uh, where, where this Living Lands organization work with, they, they are a local partner. Uh, so they, are, they were there already as a local NGO. Uh, they were supported by, by, uh, by GIZ, by the Dutch Embassy, and also we're working together with the Western Cape um, uh, environmental uh, uh, government. Uh, they had, a, they had a, a, a program, the government had a program called, uh, what was it? I think it was called uh, Working for Wetlands. These kind of programs were there. And so they were partnering with those, those, those um, institutes, uh, but they run into the same problem, short-termism. And, uh, and of course the Western Cape, 
within the Western Cape government's environmental department, there were very good people working there and they were able to, to hold up um, quite, quite a while all these, these subsidy systems to, to do landscape restoration and watershed management activities. Um, but when we came on board there, uh, yeah, we just said, listen, uh, and that's, that is very tough. We, we said, listen, we want to work with you for a minimum period of 20 years, promise. We don't know whether we are able to raise sufficient funds, but this is our promise because, because the rest is just not realistic. And you know, that completely changed something with the farmers as well as with this local uh, organization. Uh, we were building a kind of a trust entity together and they helped us with you know, the activities, the information, the storytelling, whatever. And that was for us important to convince, in this case, philanthropists in Europe and um, yeah, especially in Europe, because we, we started with philanthropy first. Uh, having been working with government funding for many years in RUCM, I realized that, um, uh, that and now I, may, now I make a very tough statement maybe, so don't quote me too much on it, but that, that political money is built on distrust. And distrust means short-termism. Uh, while, while philanthropic money can be built on trust. And this is, to, you know, if you receive money from distrust because there's a political agenda behind it, and I, I know it because I've been working with Dutch ODA money for many, many years. And, you know, the, it, it was great to work with that, that source of money, but, you know, politi politics is changing every time. And, and, uh, and you need to build a huge bureaucracy to, to get hold on that money because that bureaucracy is needed for the distrust agenda, you could say, uh, to, to cover, to, to make sure that, but, but the, 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 the thing here is if you start talking with farmers at a landscape level and say that your ambition is to really change things and that you are aware of that this really takes time, um, then, um, yeah, then, then you have started one thing, and that is creating a transformational process at the beginning already. Uh, of course, after that, we need to take care of ourselves and make sure that we can hold on different kinds of resources and so on, uh, funding. But if we can't, we still can have a relationship and we still can work together, but maybe in a very slow, sl uh, lower, lower, yeah, in a slower way. So, um, so far, my experiences. Great, thanks. We have a lot of questions about partnerships and communication, but since you were just talking about some of the financial aspects, Robin Sears asked if we could hear more about the financial aspect. And I imagine this could be, you know, a, a dive into it would probably require an hour, but could you provide a little bit more context about how you go about the financing? Yeah, so um, a little bit. I, I would suggest to, to have a, we could have another session on this uh, with, uh, with a colleague of mine, a financial expert, but, but let me first. So when I set up Common Lens, the first thing I realized is I need to have uh, some funding for making this happen. That means I need to create a team. Um, and that means you need to have funding to do to do to to prove how the, how this is working. And therefore, uh, yeah, it, it took me a while to get some philanthropists on board to to really who really understood this and said, yeah, this needs to be hap this needs to happen. And I and and those people understand that you need to do investments sometimes for a very long time before something comes back. And this in this case, those people didn't want to have the money back; they wanted to have the impact back. And they knew that this, you know, they were investments. They were sorry. They they are a philanthropist with a farmer's background, so they 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 understand what it what it is, and they understand the timelines. Uh, so that was our that is how I set up Common Land first with with funding from um, from philanthropic money before I could start to work with governments because I I didn't want to 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 rely on governments alone. Uh, haven't been. I've been working with IUCN, and I was uh, the, I, I, at that time. Uh, I was de I was dependent on on government funding, and that, as I said, is is quite hard. It's tough sometimes. 
uh, due to the political uh, stuff behind it. So at the landscape level, um, we need to first we need to raise this, let's say 500k per year to build a team, to maintain a team, to do a lot of activities like business case developments, like, like uh, making sure that, that some activities are immediately shown because people are there living there. They want to show, they don't want to talk only, they want to show and, and do things. So we've created some seed money pots there for, for farmers, a few thousand here, a few thousand there, so that they can build swales in the landscape, that they can uh, follow courses, that they can learn about composting and all these things. And meanwhile, uh, by uh, working on business cases, we were able to set up some companies. And we first, we, the first companies were kickstarted with philanthropic money and are now uh, already uh, funded by, uh, by, uh, by commercial investors. But here again, we have a profound discussion with those investors because we don't want short-termism on board. We want them to understand. So we bring them to the landscape so that they understand the harsh conditions so that they have a, get a feeling what it is so that they understand that, um, that a financial return of eight or 15% is just not possible. Uh, and, and gradually you build that movement. And uh, uh, and our hope is, of course, that uh, that this 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 amount of 500k per year per landscape will go down over time, as uh, the investors will understand and will take over a little bit of that uh, you could say uh, critical money, because they understand that this is build this that this money is 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 decreasing risk. Great. Okay. I've combined two questions um, related to communication and, and stakeholders reaching people. The first is from Juan Jose in Ecuador. He says, there are many cases in which people are resettled to allocate space for restoration because they allocate all their space to livestock and pasture. How do you handle negotiations with stakeholders? What do you propose to do? And I know this is long, but I also want to add to all of those concepts from Loretta Sadiq Lari. What types of other channels of communication do you use apart from direct meetings? Were there any conflicts in these cases among the land users, stakeholders, et cetera? If yes, what was the approach? And also, how much were local and national authorities involved? Uh, maybe, maybe I started with the, the first bit, bit, the last one, because yeah. I remember the last one. And then you please, you should repeat the other one from Ecuador. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so uh, communication. So, let's say from our side, we did you know, as Commonland, we didn't communicate a lot so far because we wanted to learn first and wanted to be at the landscape level. So, our website and, and our things and publications were very, you know, very, very poor so far. Um, in, the, in those landscapes, uh, we use different way, ways of communication. Most, uh, we have WhatsApp groups. Um, we have uh, uh, live meetings and, 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 and training uh, groups, uh, quite often, of course, with food and drinks. So it's a, a big fiesta, you could say, and that helps a lot. This is about building communities. Um, we have uh, reports. Uh, we have uh, people uh, of our local teams visiting visiting farmers and and having meetings with local uh, community leaders or or, or mayors, and uh, uh, talking about the the local um, local uh, governments. Yes, that is critical. So when we started in in South so in South Africa and in in Spain, immediately you know the local governments were involved from the beginning. Uh, I, I remember that uh, quite often there you have mayors and farmers, you know, a, a mayor who is a farmer. So, so we have them two heads in, in one meeting and, um, but, but local, so local community governments or city councils, no national governments that will come later. We, we start at the local level. So that's, I think, I hope that's more or less an answer to question uh, number, the second the question. question. Can you repeat okay. the, the, first, yes. the question on, from, from, the, from, yes. the, from Ecuador? Okay, so this is about people who are resettled to allocate yeah. space for restoration uh, because yeah. they allocate all their space to livestock and pasture. 
And so how do you handle these types of negotiations or what yeah. can you propose? To do? Yeah, this is, uh, this is, um, I, 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 this is, this is difficult. Uh, here again, uh, you need to start with community meetings uh, and we use the theory U in this case, as I explicit, as I explained before, uh, we, you need to have profound good meetings with, with the people who are, uh, are, are being resettled. Um, we see it in, uh, you see this everywhere. You see it in, in the Mara area, in, in Kenya, for instance, but also in, 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 in now in the places where in Colombia and Ecuador, you know, the, the, the whole peace process in Colombia. Um, this is, we need to understand that restoration is not a technical issue. So I have a technical background, and I'm sure many of you will have a technical background. So from a technical background, you und we understand what's needed to restore, let's say, the ecological principles of an area. But we need to deal, and we need to understand that we work with people. And for them, like for us, because we are all people, the most important thing is, how can I live well? And if we can tap into if we can build a bridge between how can you live well and how can we live well into an environment setting uh, then we have a very powerful tool and uh, so so if you talk about resettlement you we first people need to understand why do they need to resettle because they live well here so why should they move and if you bring them up to speed in conversations with sensing, with co-creation sessions, then, you know, um, be our experience, then 70 or 60% will understand that. And the, yeah, 20% will never understand it. They will always be against it. So I mean, that's, that's statistic. But if you, have the, if you have the tipping point of a group of people who understand it and want to and see that they can have a better life, um, then, then, then it will go. But take the time to do that. Don't oh, because if you don't take the time, the project will fail. Okay, so I've done quite a bit of aggregation here. Um, there's so many questions, Willem, and we still have quite a few people who are are still um, here visiting with us. So here's three that are all related to uh, where um, this approach can be used and your experiences. So um, the first is from Rosa Ortiz, who says, have there been any response or support from national policies supporting the Common Land projects? If yes, which country? And then um, Christine Nangueso from Kenya asks, um, whether there's any activities going on in Kenya. And Baksin Tan from Singapore said, thank you for the presentation. How applicable do you think these five processes will be in the tropical region context where biodiversity loss is prominent? And apologies for shortening all of these questions. Uh, yeah. Um, now, first on the, on the national policies. Um, so um, it was my ambition to first start by doing it. Uh, and not to uh, to talk to policies and, and and these kind of things. I just wanted to to make sure that this this methodology, this language tool, with all the KPIs underneath and the monitoring evaluation, and now also the monetization structure, where we're all structured within those four return three zones, twenty years, uh, and to to build experiences. And yes, we have chosen some areas um, that were uh, relatively political stable, you could say, to, because it's already very difficult. Um, but meanwhile, we started in Haiti with the Red Cross. We started in India with TNC. Um, uh, uh, we started in Zambia with Peace Parks. And, uh, and we are working uh, also, we, we started in Kenya. So, so what I've seen is, is um, yes, it is working. We are getting gradually hold on on how how it is working and what you what you need and what kind of people you need and what kind of uh, yeah that, that, and that it works actually in every environment in every ecosystem um, and now we are ready the coming year the coming two years and that's one of the reasons I said yes to this 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 um, this person this this uh, webinar with CEM 
because you know two years i think kind of when you asked me or one years ago uh, we, we just weren't ready to share our experiences now we get ready and we want indeed that uh, our ambition is that national governments and or, or regional governments uh, that this this can be helpful to achieve the sustainability goals for those governments as well as the the climate goals or the biodiversity goals um, so uh, now we're ready to share it and to write it down to publish more and to uh, to yeah to to create a little bit more influence and i hope that through iucn and the, the other important networks we can be we are able to uh, to work together to this to do this so that's the, the answer to the the, the national policies uh, on kenya yeah. sorry no go ahead but since okay, you're starting on kenya i actually truncated the question because part of the question was also about how useful this approach can be where you have animal you know predatory animal issues yeah a pre a predatory animal issues okay yeah now um actually predatory animals or uh game uh, if you talk about kenya or south africa or many african countries um what we game is of course part of of the of a business model in kenya a game is part of of of, of a business model in tourism for instance um, in South Africa, they even have other business models around game. Um, but here again, um, if you look into how to deal with game in a combined zone where you have game or predatory animals, as well as a uh, productive area, you need to look into what are the, what is the potential or let's say the maximum capacity of both entities that can uh, that can be uh, can be held in that combined zone area or buffer quite quite often in africa they they call it buffer zone but we all know that buffer zone is a very it's a difficult is is difficult to maintain a buffer zone around a national park due to all kind of reasons but if you if you um identify an area as a combined zone um where where you have a find a balance between um predatory animals uh, livestock and take the necessary measures we all know that there are there are measures you can deal with can deal with and you identify that you you, you take um, livestock as a rotational livestock grazing so not overgrazing but rotational livestock or rotational grazing systems up there and you can even get carbon money on board to sustain rotational grazing then you can also look into the um, uh, the system with predatory animals, uh, but that needs there, there are methodologies there that you can use. But if you, the, the most important thing is if you agree that this area is a combined area where you have, but with two functions, then people are going to think more creatively about what kind of methodologies or approaches can be used in that in that zone. And then the question on 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 Singapore from, from, the, from the lady from Singapore on on tropical wet systems, I think, and I'm a tropical ecologist. I was raised in tropical wet systems in Latin America. That's where I did my studies. I think this um, uh, tropical wet systems or tropical rainforest areas are excellent for this approach because the growth rate is fast. Um, the the secondary forest will 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 grow pretty fast if you use the right conditions, and you have a, a diversity of crops that you can use uh, much more than uh, than in in, in sub uh, subtropical dry areas or temperate areas. Great. So you've talked uh, quite a bit about the sustainable development goals. Um, Chris Mahone asked, do you think the UN decade of eco on ecological restoration is an opportunity for you to promote your approach? And does Common Land have the capacity to accommodate more projects? I think you already addressed the accommodating more yeah. projects with your thousand. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah I think, I think uh, Chris, uh, you're right. I think the, the UN decade, you know, we've seen a lot of UN decades. Most of them were not a success. Let's, let's be honest. We've never heard of them. Uh, I, I never heard about UN decades before the UN decades on ecosystem restoration started, but there were a lot of decades on a lot of different topics. So, but I think now we have the unique opportunity that uh, that that governments, finances, businesses, they all know that we need to restore the earth. They don't know how to restore the earth. 
we know how to restore the earth from an, let's say, a technical perspective, but we need to also be more, uh, we need to think in, in, in the people aspect as well as in the business aspect to, to make that happen. And we should never, um, we, we should not, we should not tap into, let's say, very beautiful, you know, uh, 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 propositions that would come out of the carbon markets or, or from the business market that are not realistic because we know what is needed from a landscape perspective. So I'm, I'm positive about it and we can use the sustainability goals um, uh, as, as a language tool, but also as a, as a KPI, as a, as, a, you know, as a measure rule, as a tool that you can measure because the policymakers love it, the business uh, world loves it, and so that's good. Um, so I think we all need to make the, um, um, the UN decade a success, and we need to use that tools, and, and we, we are in constant uh, conversation with them. On the capacity side, we have, agreed, we, have a we have now a new strategy within Common End uh, based on these experiences so far that we want to double our cornerstone projects from four to eight to learn more, also in, 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 in tropical areas. Um, that's number one. The second is we want to work with others. We call it the middle scale. We want to work with others who are already doing these kind of things so that they can use these tools. So they are in the lead because there's so many good organizations working on this. So use the tools and use the same language. That's our mission. If we all use the same language, it will be easier to raise funds, easier to convince governments and easier to, 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 to build this industry. But to do that well, we also need to understand that, yeah, as an expert, you know, as we are all experts, quite often we like to use our own um, uh, expertise and we say, no, no, we sh don't use landscape restoration, use uh, regenerative this or use uh, landscape rehabilitation. You, before we know, we run into the definition discussion and that's good within IUC and CEM, we can have discussions on these kind of topics, but to the outside world, we need to have one voice, one system, one framework, and that, and we should all use the same language. Then we can make a fist and can create this, can give an answer to the how question where companies and, and governments are looking, you know, they would like to hear more about the how question. How do you do this? Mm -hmm. That was my quest when I left IUC in Netherlands uh, in 2012. Great. So we won't have time to get through all the questions, but I've aggregated a few more themes just for wrapping up in the last few minutes. They're, they're really rich questions that we could spend a long time on, but there were a few that were on planning and prioritizing areas. There were a few that were on setting restoration targets. And then I thought we could end with the last word about uh, challenges. So, if you, I'll just read these, um, some of the highlights of these by theme. So first with planning and prioritizing, Manuela Ruiz was thinking of a case in Colombia and um, wondering about connectivity in areas of the landscape that aren't in the partnership. And then there was another question on planning and prioritizing related to insect outbreaks. So there were others too, but people kind of going into the details, I thought maybe um, you could comment generally on how you deal with planning and prioritizing at the landscape scale. Yeah, well, this is uh, again a, a tough question. <laughs> Oops. Um, yeah, you can, you can plan and prioritize from an ecosystem perspective. And then of course you talk about biodiversity, connectivity of protected areas, uh, watershed management uh, connectivity, uh, let's say uh, remove invasives and plants, natives and so on. Um, and that, 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 that's all wonderful. But if we, or if those, if the experts or let's say the conservation organization or the landscape partnership is not able to bridge that with the, um, with the aims and goals of farmers and local uh, landowners, then before you know it, you run into uh, heavily debates, polarized discussions. So here again, the mapping session and the, de the landscape design sessions are critical to, to start there first, so that if you start to, to, to look into uh, uh, planning and mapping, uh, people uh, or the majority of the landscape partners uh, are do understand that that is needed and also quite often they are landowners so so what we do for instance what we've learned is that 
this three zone approach is of course is a, is a you know if you zoom out you can have a three zone approach at the wider landscape session but if you zoom in again you know it's already wonderful if a farmer starts to use the three zone approach in his own farm and then you can create connectivity between different farms so it is it 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 it, it is um it is a question of of patience and also action and and finding the action uh, the finding to do let's say some actions that are completely right from an ecological ecosystem perspective and some actions that are not yet right but you do it because the social coherence you create with those actions are more important at that moment and that that's you need to fine-tune and, and find that balance between those two things uh, on the connectivity is yeah the most wonderful thing is on the map you need to make sure that you have the connectivity organized but then if you deep if you make a deep dive and, and go into the specific land ownership situation you are run into tough debates tough conversations and yes there will be a lot of quarrel and there will be a, and 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 uh, you know people are people and farmers are farmers and and we all can can have our own uh, thinking behind what is good and not good so um what what we've seen is that if you zoom in quarrel starts if you zoom out quarrel disappears and then you so you need to zoom in and zoom out several times so that the quarrel or the, the polarization decreases um maybe this sounds a bit uh, strange or technical but um uh, i hope you 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 get it a little bit so psychology is important here yeah insect outbreaks like for instance in in eastern africa um yeah this is uh, this is all as we know uh, this is this is this is caused by a different kind of uh, this had uh, several causes. Uh, sometimes you just need to understand that that's that that that's uh, uh, you need to take actions that might not be sustainable at that right moment, but on the long run will help to build commitment to work towards a sustainable agenda. Okay, so um, we are coming close to being a half an hour over time because of the rich questions and discussion. Um, monitoring was something that you didn't really talk about. Is there information on monitoring in your document? Yeah, we have, uh, we, we have, uh, we have monitoring, uh, we have a whole team on monitoring evaluation. So yeah. um, uh, we can uh, we can bring you up to speed to that theme. Yes, uh, it and we we have. So the most important thing is we want the farmers and the landscapes to monitor themselves. But we have a we have a we have a how do you say a framework for monitoring. Fantastic. So let's just go right to this last question on challenges. And if you have a few words about what's been the most dis difficult part of your process. Oh, um, I think I need another hour. <laughs> no, but uh, if, if, uh, you know, uh, of course, um, this for returns thinking is the opposite of maximization of return on investment. So every time when I speak or when I meet investors or philanthropists or governments or even farmers, you know, uh, this is 360 degrees different from what they are used of, from, from, from business as usual. So the first challenge is finding the right language to the right target groups to make sure that they understand and 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 are open for a conversation um, and and that means sometimes our team and I, including myself we need to be a chameleon um, in language um, that is challenge number, and especially the investment community is very tough because they 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 have a complete different mindset and and, and way of talking but also sometimes with our own, you know, uh, our own or, uh, conservation organizations that are very much focused on only conservation areas or only, or, or the farmers only on agriculture, whatever. So that's number one. The second thing is, is funding, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, our story now is, and after seven years, we can say, you know, if you want us to work in a landscape, we need 10 million. And we don't want to move away from that 10 million. If you don't believe in it, just go away because we don't want to work with you because you're an idealist and we don't want to work with idealists and if you say that to a corporate for instance or to a large 
um, you know, financial institute, the DFI, Development Finance Institute, they don't like that. But the funny thing is, we need to repeat that message. If we don't repeat that message, we, we, you know, it's just, I, I'm fed up. And, and I'm sure you recognize it. We are all fed up with working from one project to another. And you know, the, the lady from US, USAID said it rightly. You know, it, it, you know, I've seen so, I've been working in so many projects. And if I look back, you know, yeah, the Dutch government put 500K in that project for four years. And if you look back 10 years later, what happens? Yeah, nothing, because they couldn't, you know, it, <laughs> It was impossible to do something very big for 500k in that, dip, in that difficult area. So let's be realistic and let's use realism here. We are experts. The people, you know, with the corona crisis, people are listening to experts, but we are experts for healing the planets. So they should listen to us as well now. Yes. Uh, so that's the next challenge. And then you have a while, many, many, you have hundreds of thousands of challenges at the local countryside because you work with two difficult things. Work with people, very difficult, and you work with ecosystems, very difficult. It would be easier to work with the robots in the digital game, <laughs> of course. But not, that's not a reality. Like this forest behind me is just a picture. It's not my, it's not a, yeah, it is a forest, but it's not real. <laughs> And the image behind me is clearly not real because it's <laughs> rabbit swimming in an aquarium. Willem, thank you so much for this really rich sharing of the four returns. It's been fantastic. The video will be posted. I'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions. Please come next month in May. Our webinar will be by Jim Hallett. We'll be talking about the GPFLR, the Global Partnership for Forest Landscape Restoration, which has been uh, coordinating activities for the Bond Challenge and other global forest restoration initiatives. So thanks everyone. You have emails if you need to get a hold of Brock or myself, uh, chairs of the Ecosystem Restoration Thematic Group. And there's also the links there again to find Willem and reports on the four returns. So thanks everyone. Thank you very much and I uh, hope you stay safe. Bye bye. Yes.